All right, well, here we are, session number two. I've been tasked or asked to speak to the young men of our church. Now, I don't want you guys to think that uh, if you're in your upper 20s or low 30s that you do not apply because Timothy, when he was being written to by Paul in First and Second Timothy, he's, it's believed that he was around 30 years old. So we have two broad categories here this morning. We have young people and old people, and that's it. No one in between. So you're either young or you're an elder. So in this idea, and thinking of this idea of finishing well, the question could be asked, you know, how does one who is young finish well? Can this spiritual truth even apply to one who is young? After all, in, in theory, our spiritual journeys could have years or, or decades left. And this would not be good, but perhaps many of us were just thinking about our life, you know, our careers, our finishing our educations, establishing our jobs, settling down in this world. But still, one day, there's going to come a day where we will either be able to say, as Paul did, that I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith, or we will have forsaken these things, having loved this present world. It's one of those two things. And so naturally, in order to finish well, we must first begin the race or the fight. And then we must continue in the race that has been set before us. And so the basis of this teaching will be built around 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. So let's turn there, 1 Timothy 4, 12. Just one verse, so let's read it, and then we will pray. Let people get there. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says this. Paul speaking says, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. That is the verse. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the words that we heard last night, Lord, for the reminder of fighting the good fight, Lord, the, the holy calling that you have called us into, Lord, of desiring and Lord, to, to finish the course well, to have kept the faith. Lord, whatever age that we are, Lord, in this room, Lord, if we have been born again, and if we've been called by you, God, then there is a responsibility that we have, Lord, in how we run the race and, Lord, how we finish the race. So, Father God, I pray that there would be no distractions because of me. And Lord, I pray that there'd be no distractions in our minds and our hearts, but, Lord, that you would capture our minds and our attention. And Lord, that we would be rooted and, glued, rooted and just glued to, Lord, these things because it's your word and it's your truth. And so, Lord, I pray that we could Lord, receive this from you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There is an idea throughout scripture of sometimes youthfulness being connected to immaturity or recklessness or even sin. The psalmist asked in Psalm chapter 25, he asked that God not remember the sins of his youth. In our youth, we are very young, obviously, and we're immature. But then we are strong, we're brave, we're ready to walk into any struggle or battle in life. King Solomon, he knew this, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote, in Proverbs chapter two, verse one, and I want us to, to hear the, the passion in his voice and, and the words that he was using. He, King Solomon, he wrote and he said, my son, if you will receive my words 
And if you will hide my commands with you so that you incline your ear unto wisdom. And if you apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as for silver and search for her as for hid treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Incline, apply, cry after, lift up your voice, seek, search, and then you will understand. There are hundreds and hundreds of proverbs for the young man. Words of godly wisdom, corrections, and warnings. Some of these things are repeated over and over and over and over again, just the way that a young man needs things to be. Our youthfulness can be used for great destruction and evil, or our youthfulness can be channeled and used towards serving our Lord and Master. In our youthfulness, we can either serve the flesh and so reap the flesh, or we can serve God and so reap the spiritual blessings that come from obeying God. And so young men, one thing that I want to convince you of today and something that we heard last night, and even if you already know this, but is that you cannot serve two masters. You will either love this world and you will hate God or you will hate this world and you will love God and so finish well. And so Paul's command to Timothy in this verse in our text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, his command is to let no one look down on your youthfulness. Other Bible versions say that let no one despise your youth. And this word in the Greek, katafreneo, it means to think against someone. Sorry, Ernie. It means to disparage, to disregard, to slight This word often has negative connotations in the scriptures when it's used. It talks about the despising of parents, people despising the law of God, God himself, the goodness of God, rulers that God has put in place, etc. But Timothy is to let no one, that is, he is to allow nobody at all to despise him. And Paul, he's putting this responsibility on Timothy. Timothy was young and he was in the ministry. He was serving in the church and he was to give no one an occasion to despise his youth. Of course, that's an easy statement to make all by itself. But thankfully, Paul continues to explain how. And so there are five things that I want us to take note of from this verse. Five characteristics for the young men of this church in Manassas. And then just one closing point for the elders of this church. And of these five points, the first two, they relate to our public lives. And then the last three points, they speak of inner qualities that motivate outward action. And so number one, the first characteristic, the first outward characteristic that Paul mentions is that of our speech. He says, but rather in speech. This is the famous Greek word logos. Our words, the vocalized expressions of our minds should be an example to those who are around us. Let's turn together, because it's slightly long. Let's go to James chapter three. We know this text. We were in it on Sunday, Sundays, recently. But it's good to read and it's good to be reminded. James chapter three We're going to read verses 1 through 10. It says this. Verse 1. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says... He is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. 
Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they're still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set, on, is set among our members as that which defiles the body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. For with it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes both blessings and curses. My brethren, these things ought not to be. The tongue. How deadly the tongue can be. But then how amazing it can be when we're proclaiming forth truth. Men, it's not simply outright cursing that we must be on guard from coming out of our mouths. Think of what can proceed out of our mouths that is contrary to God's word. Boasting bragging, gossiping, slandering, coarse and filthy jokes, complaining, lying, fighting, arguing, being quick to speak, slow to listen. The list could go on. There are so many different types of sins that we can commit with our tongues. And so let us not pat ourselves on the back and think of what areas we're strong in. But let us examine our hearts and truly ask ourselves, where am I deficient with my tongue? Where do I fail? Where am I lacking? Let us remember that whatever comes out of our mouth is a reflection of what is in our minds. God's word, I'm gonna spit some verses out. So if you're keeping notes, Sorry, maybe just jot down the verses, but Proverbs 12, 13 says that an evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous man will escape from trouble. Think of what our mouths can get us into, the type of trouble, just one stupid word and uh, a lot can come from it. Proverbs 15, 4, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit, the words of a man who's encouraging you or uplifting you. Think of the the soothing nature of that. Proverbs 15, seven, the lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the hearts of fools are not so. Proverbs 21, 23, he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. Proverbs 26, 20, the Proverbs, man. For the lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer or gossip, contentions quiet down. Matthew 15, 11, It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. Last one, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And this is a quotation from the Old Testament, but... For the one who desires life to love and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And so when we are honest with ourselves before God, when we can identify what it is that our tongue does that is not of God, what comes out of it, then we can move forward with repentance, with help from the Holy Spirit to tackle such things. If we wanna be true men of God, then our speech, our words must reflect that. Number two, the second outward characteristic that Paul mentions is that of our conduct. There are the words that we speak, the things that we say, and then right alongside that are our actions. This word in the Greek, 
It speaks of our behavior, our way of life, the way in which we conduct ourselves. And so the question is simple. How are we behaving? How are we conducting ourselves in our daily living? Are we behaving like young, immature, worldly individuals? Or are we behaving like men of God? Men that have the mark of God in their lives, the spirit residing within them. We read this on Sunday, but I want us to turn to it. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter four, verse 22. We're coming in in the middle of a thought, but that's okay. If we remember Sunday's teaching, we're all good. Ephesians 4, verse 22. It says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. In verse 22, when it says, in reference to your former manner of life, that's the very same word in the Greek for conduct or behavior that Paul uses in 1 Timothy chapter 4. So hopefully we see the contrast here. There are only two types of behavior. First, there is the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Men, any conduct or behavior that does not reflect Christ and what he would do comes from a lust for deceitful pleasures and evil fun. That is its source. Whenever you and I do anything in life, We are not participating in a morally neutral activity. We are either walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. We see in Ephesians chapter four, verse 24, two verses down, that the second type of behavior or conduct is that of the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and the holiness of truth. This is the conduct that we are to live in, that Paul speaks of. The new man that we have become in Christ has literally been created in righteousness and holiness. If this is so, then how could we love the things of this world more than the things of God? We all sin. I'm not talking about the one who's walking with God, sins, hates his sin, repents, picks himself back up and continues walking on with God. But I am talking about the one who loves the conduct and behaviors of the things in this world more than walking in the new self. What do you love more? Truly, reading your Bible or playing a video game? Which one excites you more? Hanging out with friends or listening to a sermon? You know, the Puritans used to speak for hours teaching. Truly ask yourself though, where do your interests lie? What do you love? And what do you most often conduct yourselves in? Worldly things or spiritual things? Now, none of these things that I've mentioned or could mention are sinful in and of themselves. But the question is, what is gripping our hearts? Truly, I do not want us feeling good about ourselves because our conduct is not blatantly evil as someone else's that we might know of. Let us examine our hearts. Are we being renewed in the spirit of our minds? Are we conducting ourselves and behaving as righteous and holy children of God? First Peter one verse 14 says, as obedient children, Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One, Jesus, who called you, be holy yourselves. Also in all of your behavior, 
Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. James chapter three, verse 13 says that who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. And Paul's command to Timothy to allow no one to look down upon him in his youthfulness. Paul has mentioned the two characteristics that make up and define our outward living, our speech and our conduct. Paul continues with a third point, number three. The third point speaks of an inner quality that motivates outward action. And that is love. Love is talked about a lot. The word is probably overused and misused. But this here is speaking of the love that we have probably all heard again many times, agape love, charity. In the New Testament, this word is used of the loyal love between a man and a woman, of the mutual love between believers, of the love that we have for outsiders and for our enemies. This love, it speaks of the father's love for the son and for the son's love for the father. This love marks God's love for the world and for sinners. It characterizes Christ's love for his church and individual people. This love reveals the deepest nature of God. He is love. Agape love does not show us just an aspect of God or a feature of his character. Rather, it captures the very nature of who God is. And it summarizes all of God's activities and deeds and actions and words throughout the history of man. This is the steadfast covenant love of God that he has shown to his people. This is a love that is freely given and it's an everlasting love. To know this love, to experience this love, it is, that is salvation, which has been purchased through Christ's death and resurrection. Here, the great commandment to love is joined with the message of salvation. The command to love can only be given, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, because he first loved us. The ability to love others in this capacity is realized only because he first loved us. This does not refer to any sort of sentimental love that's demonstrated purely by lip service, but to a love that is ca characterized by will, by sacrifice, and by action as it reaches towards others. It is unconditional and it's unwavering because it reflects what God did for us on Calvary. This love should enter in to everything that we do in this world for God and for others. One thing that I see in the young men in this church, and again, this isn't a bash, but I see it, is that we're very self-absorbed in our own lives, in our favorite friends, in our favorite activities, that we can miss out on true loving deeds of self-sacrifice of service and action for others. I see this as a potential problem for everyone, of course, but especially for the, those who are young. We can be so caught up in the world and what we are doing that our eyes are not always open towards loving those around us in a way that's gonna cost us something. Let's go to 1 John chapter four. We could go to 1 Corinthians 13, but we're not because everyone goes there. So, 1 John... Great verses, word of God. But First John chapter four. First, uh, chapter four, verse six. It says, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his son, his, sorry, only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Young men, church, the evidence of God abiding in us is going to be the love that we have for one another. The fourth point, number four, that Paul brings in 1 Timothy, which I lost my place there. It's okay. But 1 Timothy chapter four, the fourth point that speaks of another inner quality that motivates outward action is that of faith. Faith also is a huge word with a very wide range of meanings throughout the New Testament. As believers in Jesus Christ, everything that we do is rooted in faith. This word speaks of trust, reliability, confidence, assurance, conviction, and belief in It is by faith through the grace of God that we came to be born again. Having begun in the faith, it is through this system ordained by God that we will also finish our race. We are told to stand fast in the faith, to be full of faith, to have a faith that will grow stronger. Faith is a basic principle of Christianity. Faith stands over against the law. God says that the righteous man will live by faith. That is, he will not live by the works of the law. Our lives are lived out in a trust and a belief in the perfect work of Jesus Christ, whose righteousness has been imputed to us. We received the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Having begun in this way, Paul encouraged the early church that since they had come to know God, or rather to be known by God, he said not to turn back to the weak and worthless elemental things which they were enslaved to before faith. With the grace of God working through us, because of faith in him, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have all the tools that we need to walk in his ways to follow and to obey him. The fruit of the spirit, which all comes by faith, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against these things, there is no law. In Christ, we have been crucified, the flesh with its passions and its desires. And this is all because of faith. But men, there is also a faithfulness that we need in keeping the faith. The truth that has been handed down to us from men of God. Young men, we are the next generation. In 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, as God begins to take his saints home, is God's representation of his church in Manassas going to dwindle away, weaken or rot? Or are we going to step up and be found as men faithful? If Christ comes in our lifetime to take his church home, will we be found faithful? Will we be found with oil in our lamps ready? Or are we playing games with God because we're young and we have time? Think about Are we diligent in the faith? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 is where we'll start.
Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us draw near, church, with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith because of what he has done. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us not forsake the assembling of each other. Let us remain faithful in the faith that has been handed down to us. The one who we serve is worthy of it. He is faithful. He is just. He's reliable. And it's our, our due diligence. Number five. The fifth point is the final mentioned inner quality that motivates outward action. Purity. This word literally means sinlessness of life. Now we know that we all sin. And he who says that he has no sin is deceiving himself and the truth is not in him. This word, it speaks of keeping oneself pure from the sins of others who are around you. Paul only uses this specific word for purity twice. And the other time is in chapter five, verse 22, where he tells Timothy to keep himself free from sin. It's the same word that's used. There's a million ways that we can talk about purity. But no doubt, one of the greatest sins that young men have a hard time conquering in their lives is that of sexual sins. Do not put pride in yourself, young men, if you have never committed adultery. The Bible teaches that if we look at with lust for a woman, that we have already committed adultery with her in our hearts. Let's be real. 99% of people these days have a cell phone. What do we do with it? What do we allow our eyes to take in? You don't have to be a prophet to know and to say that even in this room, there are too many men who have succumbed to sexual sins in their private lives. Often, what can happen is that the guilt is so strong and that it's so embarrassing that we believe no one else is struggling with it. It's only me. And so we remain silent. We hate pornography. We hate all the sins that come with it. But we do it again and again and again. And we're tormented inside because we want victory. We love God. It's a battle that can hardly be won alone. James chapter five says, therefore, if you confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Young men, you need to link yourself up with a man of God who is older and wiser than you in the Lord and ask for prayer. Make yourself accountable to them. Take seriously the command from the Lord to remain pure and clean. I say these things with, with zero condemnation. I love you and God loves you even more than I do. God has designed it in this way that through the work on the cross that he did, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the fellowship of the saints, all of these things that God has done, we have everything that we need in life 
to live for him in a pure and holy manner. Everything that we need. I know, of course, there are so many other sins that can taint our walks with God. And so if we're not struggling with anything that I've mentioned, I still want to encourage us to examine our lives. What type of media are we taking in? What type of individuals are we around that can cause us to be impure, stained? Are we seeing too much with our eyes? Are we hearing too much with our ears? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so everything that we hear and everything that we see and do must be pure and must be holy. Can I do this hanging out with Jesus? Psalm 119, verse nine. I know many of us know it and love it. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. And may this be our prayer. With all my heart, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Proverbs 21 verse 8 says that the way of a guilty man is crooked. But as for the pure, his conduct is upright. Timothy was told in 2 Timothy verse 2 for 2 Timothy 2:22, Timothy was told, "Now flee from youthful lusts." Paul knew the inclinations of the young man. So did King Solomon. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Paul has challenged Timothy, and God is challenging us, church. He has said, instead of allowing others to despise you, rather do the very opposite. You, as a young man, be an example. Rise up to the occasion, man of God. In these five points that have just been discussed, speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, you young men, be examples of these things. This word example that Paul uses in um, 1 Timothy 4.12, it means a pattern or a model. We are to be a model of these things for other people. As we move about in our daily lives and as we come to church, our elders should look at us as examples. Paul has set the bar very high. I look at my own life and I see the immaturity and just everything that I could think or say, the stupidity of it. And somehow I'm supposed to be a pattern for other people. Young men, this is what we must pursue. This is how we are going to finish well. I want us to encourage us to take seriously the charge from this scripture. A cross-reference, Titus chapter 2, verse 6. And in a similar manner, it says this. It says, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. So that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. That's our charge. That's our calling, young men. One point for the elders in this church. Those who have been walking with God for many, many years. My request to you is that you guys live as Paul's. For the young men of this church. I will say that this is something that our church does very well. And so this is not a, a, a rebuke type. It's an encouragement and a reminder. There are no excuses for our youthfulness. We are supposed to strive very hard in our walks with God. But I know that an older man 
is a great tool in the hand of God to help strengthen and grow the young men of this church. As Paul did for Timothy, there are words of wisdom, of knowledge, of discernment, commands, and warnings that you guys can give. And so as you're doing, and maybe for those that are not, invest spiritually in the lives of the young men of our church. As the baton is passed from one generation to another, it will take two things to keep this church strong and alive. It will take men of God, full of the Holy Spirit, young men who walk humbly with God, And it will take elders and leaders who are training them up in righteousness and teaching them in the things of God. Psalm 71 verse 17 says, O God, you have taught me from my youth and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to all who are to come. And so this is what we need from you. Church, I want to finish well. In physical competitions that we do, and running a race, for example, we know just how focused we have to be. There is no time to slow down or to be complacent. If you do that, Daniel Mercado or Reed Soliday will pass you. It's a contest. It's constant. One foot in front of the other. Young men, if we want to finish well, then this is what we must do. There's no option. We must be sober and alert, always active and pursuing God. Never lazy, never complacent. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are weak, Lord, we are frail, Lord, we are incompetent in and of ourselves, and Lord, there's no good in us, Lord, the wretches that we are who will save us from this body of death, but thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we thank you so much that though there is a battle that we are in and a fight and a struggle, where we have spiritual weapons of warfare that are so great. And Lord, the enemy must tremble. Lord, when your word is used and when your truth is spoken Lord, we want to rest in you. God, we want to live out our lives and work out our salvations with fear and with trembling. But Lord, we want to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Father God, I pray for the young men of this church. I pray for myself. I pray for my peers, for those that are younger, those that are older. Lord, that you would sanctify us. God, that you would set us apart. Lord, that you would prick our hearts. Lord, of those sins that are just so hard to escape. And God, that we would not do it through the arm of the flesh. But Holy Spirit, God, that we would run to you. And Lord, that we would find, Lord, spiritual freedom in you. And Lord, that this would be a true organic living body of believers where the young men, Lord, derive wisdom from your word, but then also from the older men and where the older men find their strength and productivity in the young men. And Lord, that there would be an iron sharpening iron and Lord, just the the balance of how you made the church. God, we love you. And Lord, we wanna wanna walk in your ways. We wanna do things according to your will. Lord, give us the strength to do that. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen.